is 1346. It is a hot and humid August day. Edward III's English army has crossed the Somme and are atop the ridge near Crucy de Ponthou. They stand in formation and wait for the advancing French army on top of a slight hill. They are looking down the slope into the valley that would become one of the most horrific killing grounds in medieval history. The Battle of Crecy would become a great victory for the English and an embarrassing and ghastly defeat for the French. When Edward III came to the throne in 1327, he inherited an ongoing war with France as well as Scotland. This would become known as the Hundred Years' War. It started as an on-again, off-again struggle between England and France over territory located in northern France. When Philip VI of Valois became king of France, Edward paid him homage as king. In 1337, Philip VI confiscated territories of northern France out of the English hands and enraged Edward. The idea of invading France had been floating around the English court since the beginning of the war. The landing, which took place in Normandy, has been debated about by historians over whether the landing was intentional or by accident due to an uprising storm in the channel. On the 11th of July, 1346, Edward mustered his forces and crossed the channel to land in the small port town of St. Vost. The invasion had begun. After landing at St. Vost, the English army would continue a march toward Rouen and get tantalizing close to Paris. But instead of fighting a pitched battle outside the great city, Edward would lead his army north toward Crecy and lure the French to him. The county of Ponthou, in which Crecy was located, offered a number of advantages for Edward. First, this area had been largely unscathed by the war. The towns were largely unfortified, which would allow the army to get food and supplies. And the area was ideal for a defensive battle. All of these factors may have been going through Edward's mind as he turned his army north and attempted to cross the Somme River. By the 20th of August, Edward's forces had reached the Somme Valley. Things were beginning to look bleak. The army must have been incredibly tired from hundreds of miles of forced marches and food and supplies were running low. The French army was not far from meeting them and would soon attack in force. Edward had a few options. He needed to cross the Somme and get to high ground in order to fight a battle on his terms or face retreat west back towards the sea. Whatever he chose, he had to do it quickly. There were various crossings along the way from Amiens to Abbeville, but these were heavily fortified. Thus the English moved west and rested before trying to find a way to cross the Somme. Philip only saw three ways out for Edward. Defeat, starve, or drown. Nevertheless, the English had another trick up their sleeve. There was knowledge of a ford used to cross the estuary. It was no secret, and many of the locals knew it, as did men within the ranks who had lived in the area. This was the last chance for Edward's forces. If they could find and cross at the ford, they could escape north toward Crecy and await the French on their own terms. Philip of France got word and was only six miles from the English. Philip felt victory was in grasp, and if he pushed further, he could trap the English at high tide. However, he moved too slowly. Edward marched his forces at first light toward the ford, and by the time they had crossed, Philip was still several miles behind. Now the French had to ford the river, which gave Edward time to move his forces further north and get much needed food and rest. Edward then turned his forces inland on a deliberate march toward Crecy. It was as if he knew the topography of the area was made for such a battle as he had in mind. Between the town of Crecy and the hamlet of Watercourt runs a ridge which slopes down into a valley. The slope is not excessive. It would not have stopped mounted knights from riding up it, but it would have greatly hindered their speed. Behind this position stood a dense forest. To the ridge's left was a point of high ground which looked down into the valley, and to the right the hill fell off steeply toward Crecy itself. That night, the 25th of August, the English soldiers ate what little food they had and hunkered down to rest in preparation for the following day's events. The trumpets would sound early in the morning, and the army would wake to take its defensive positions along the ridge overlooking the valley. At sunrise, the English army formed up using the three formations it had been fighting in throughout the campaign in France. The vanguard division would be posted near the southwestern edge of the ridge, with its right flank protected by a steep fall-off. This division would get most of the fighting, as the English assumed, correctly, that the French would come head-on across the valley below. This division contained the most experienced fighters, and was led by the King's son, the Prince of Wales. This division contained roughly 10,000 men, of which were men-at-arms, archers, and foot soldiers. According to English tactical doctrine at the time, the men-at-arms dismounted their horses, which were sent to the rear, and formed up facing down the hill, while the archers were placed along their flanks. 
The question of where the archers were exactly has confounded many historians. But the most reasonable explanation by historian Alfred Burns is that the archers formed up in two solid triangular wedges of about a thousand men each, with one wedge positioned on the right flank and the other on the left flank. Since the longbow cannot be directly fired except at extremely close range, the archers in the rear could shoot over those in the front, creating a tremendous volley of death for the advancing enemy. This would prove to be a critical factor of the battle. The intended purpose was to channel the advancing French knights towards the dismounted English men-at-arms and spearmen, as it would not likely charge toward a volley of arrows, and thus open up their flanks to the wedged archers, creating an effective killing machine. To drive this point home, the English longbowmen had also dug pits in front of their position to stop the advancing mounted French knight, or greatly impede his efforts. Behind this vanguard division would be the rear guard, led by the Bishop of Durham and the Earl of Arundel. It would act as reserves for the Prince of Wales's division, if it needed assistance as well as protection of their left flank if the French were able to break through. This division was formed up roughly like the vanguard division, only in smaller numbers, with each of its wedges made up of only 600 archers. Behind this was the third division led by King Edward himself. Its purpose was extra reserves for either division. The mounted, armored horseman of the 14th century was most armies most vital weapon. The man-at-arms was a lethal weapon guided by an unwritten social rule book called the Code of Chivalry, which included such notions as duty to country, belief in God, and protection of the innocent. This man would have been equipped with armor, at the time either chainmail composed of hundreds of interlocking iron rings or solid plate armor. Chainmail was fading out and being replaced with solid armor, as it could not hold up against an English longbow or crossbow. These weapons were simply too powerful and penetrated through it. These men also carried shields, lances, daggers, and swords. A fully armored man-at-arms at this time period would be carrying roughly 80 pounds of armor and equipment. The simple foot soldier would be armored with quilted padding and perhaps a leather hat. His weapons included a short sword or hand axe, and perhaps a clubbing weapon or a spear. The French shoulder at Cressy likely made do with whatever they could get their hands on. The English foot soldiers were similar, but within their ranks were skilled spearmen from North Wales. The most important weapon given to some of foot soldiers would be missile weapons, crossbows for the French and the longbows for the English. The French crossbowmen were hired mercenaries who came from all over Italy, but are often referred to as the Genoese. These men were professionals and skilled. The crossbows they used at the time are similar to hunting crossbows used today. At close range, the crossbow could penetrate plate armor, but at 200 yards was only really effective against unarmored targets.